Hello, everyone. Welcome to our next to last lecture. I can't believe it. How the fall is, is uh, racing by. Wanted to ask for your help for a moment, if I might. We are looking for someone to help us with database management. If you or someone you know, a neighbor, a friend, a family member, could help us with database management. And basically what that is, is keeping records of all the members in the association, sending out emails. We would help and train whoever that is. So if you have ideas or someone might have questions about it, call me or email info at eevermont.org or you could email Glenn. Thank you so much. So now I'd like to ask Michael Orlansky of our program committee to please introduce today's speaker. Michael. Thank you, Carol, and hello, everyone. Today we welcome Kelly Helmstetler Didio, Professor of Art History and Associate Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at the University of Vermont. Professor Helmstetler Didio earned her master's and PhD degrees in art history at Rutgers. At State University of New Jersey. Her main academic focus is on Italian and Spanish sculpture of the 16th and 17th centuries. Earlier this week, in fact, she hosted and co-organized a major international conference on Italian Renaissance sculpture here at UVM. Her scholarly interests include Michelangelo, portrait medals and female power, artists' friendships in Renaissance Europe, museum studies, and art and its destruction. <clears throat> Kelly has involved many UVM students in community-based arts projects, research, and exhibits on themes such as street art, activism and art, gender and sexuality in art, and the history of Confederate monuments. She's published many well-received articles, essays, and books, and guest lectured at museums and universities in Europe Canada and the US, among them the Prado in Madrid, the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC, and recently at her own alma mater, Rutgers. Professor Helmstetler Didio's research has earned fellowships from various sources, including the Ministry of Arts and Culture of Spain, the Medici, Medici Archive Project, and Itati. Harvard University's Center for Italian Renaissance Studies near Florence. She's been honored with the Krebs Morris Award for Excellence in Undergraduate Teaching at UVM. Kelly and her family moved to Vermont 19 years ago after living in Italy. They currently have six animals, all of whom are named for Italian artists. Today, Kelly Helmstetler Didio will speak on monuments, memory, and loss in the American cityscape. Thank you and welcome. Thank you so much for that wonderful and generous and kind introduction. Uh, that was lovely. I, I feel quite humbled by it. Um, and, and I'm grateful to be invited here to uh, be a part of this group and share some of my uh, research and thoughts about um, what is going on with monuments in the United States, which has been so much in the news. Um, and so I'm, I'm grateful for this opportunity and want to thank Michael in particular for reaching out to me and just being such a, a lovely host, uh, even in this virtual world. So thank you for that. I will jump right in uh, to my talk and then have time at the end uh, for questions, which I think are through the chat box. Uh, you probably all know the drill better than I do. So uh, as Michael mentioned, um, I have been working on um, Italian Renaissance sculpture in particular, which is what I, I got my specialization in um, at Rutgers. And that is what my primary scholarly focus is. But uh, I have sort of naturally gravitated to thinking about um, the role of sculpture in the United States. Uh, and I think I, I come at that uh, natu so naturally because of two perspectives. 
One is my uh, training in Italian Renaissance sculpture where public sculpture was of enormous importance as a means of communication. Uh, and then uh, from my uh, being born and raised in the state that has the most Confederate monuments in the United States, uh, the state of Virginia. So I come at it, as I say, from, from these two perspectives and want to share with you um, some of my thoughts as public school sculpture in the US has become so widely discussed um, and so widely targeted uh, by protesters and by um, people on the other side of the protest that are concerned about the preservation of what they see that monument standing for. Um, so uh, again, I appreciate your time today and, and, and bear with me as I, I very passionately talk about the, uh, these sculptures that I find so fascinating. So I'm going to start with Italy, which is where, uh, for me, um, public sculpture really gets exciting. But it's also true that there are important examples of public sculpture from the very beginnings of the history of art. Um, I certainly think about ancient Mesopotamian culture, um, but you know other examples, and uh, there very well may have been uh, public monuments even in the prehistoric era that were really meant to do the same things we see monuments doing today, um, which is to communicate a set of ideals that a certain group of people holds and wants to sort of make public, be shared in a public space to be engaged with um, or seen as a model of behavior, um, which is often how we see monuments um, performing in public spaces. But there are instances where, and many instances, frankly, where we see that, you know, their situation in a public space becomes problematic over time or becomes, you know, no longer represents the value sets of the people um, that are engaging in it in their daily lives. And I certainly think this example uh, is a great example of that. This is um, a monument to Ferdinando I de Medici. Um, the Medici family, uh, you know, the sort of source of money uh, and patronage and all that makes uh, the Italian Renaissance so exciting uh, in Florence. And Ferdinando I de Medici was uh, engaged in these new means of uh, trade and transportation and exchange um, in the late 16th and early 17th centuries, and that included the uh, slave trade. And he uh, had Giovanni Bandini and Pietro Tacca uh, create this monument um, to honor his role in this, um, which he saw as being you know, uh, an important role in maintaining or even elevating the status of um, the port of Livorno in particular, which was the major port for Tuscany, uh, where the Medici's uh, reigned from. Um, so this monument shows us Ferdinando standing very proudly in white marble, and then around the base of this pedestal are these images of slaves. And we know they're slaves. Um, they, in fact, have even been identified uh, as individuals um, in some cases, at least uh, hypothesized. But we know they're slaves because of the way that they're positioned in these crouching poses, the fact that they are almost completely nude um, and that they are chained to the pedestal. So it's, it's quite clear uh, that we are meant to understand them as slaves and subservient to Ferdinando who stands so proudly above them. Um, they are done not in the white marble that Ferdinando's monument, his statue is done in, but in bronze, um, which, adds to this coloristic effect of the monument and certainly is also meant to help us 
identify that these are men that are coming from Africa. Um, in the, sorry, hit the wrong button. Um, even in the 17th hundreds, and certainly uh, as we get into the 1800s, it's not that people saw this monument and found it to be perfectly acceptable. It was seen in ways that I think are not dissimilar from how some people see this monument today. Um, and we have a record of one of Napoleon's generals as they you know, are going through uh, Italy um, and engaging with in somewhat in sometimes very problematic ways like looting with the art uh, in Italy and Napoleon's general uh, comes across this monument in, in Livorno that we just looked at and really questions um, its iconography, um, how it's composed, what kind of meanings are meant to be taken from looking at it. Um, and it says uh, that it's a very distressing spectacle to see this statue as you come um, onto the port. Uh, and it, inv it invokes feelings of pain, scorn, contempt, and hatred, um, which, as he says, should, should disturb every sensible soul that approaches it. And he uh, suggests that um, instead of this statue, there should be a statue of liberty that is uh, that substitutes this and that we should break the chains of the four slaves and smashes with a pick the head of Ferdinando and spread it out on the ground. So really vitriolic reaction to the iconography of this statue even in this period when certainly you know, the slave trade certainly uh, existed. Um, so that, that's sort of one perspective that I come with is looking at you know, Renaissance statues and the way that we see them today. And the, you know, the Taka's monument of, of Ferdinando I is unusual in how starkly that iconography of slavery um, and white dominance is, is communicated, but it's not an anomaly. We see uh, similar sorts of images in, in paintings and other sorts of sculptures, but its placement in the public square in Livorno is pretty exceptional. Um, and uh, important to point out that today, uh, Livorno is quite a, a diverse city um, and there are there's a, quite a population there of um, Italian Africans or uh, newly uh, migrated Africans that live uh, in that city and interact with that sculpture and have, you know, understandably asked that something be done with it and have it removed from the public square. And because it's an important Renaissance statue, there's been a lot of mixed reactions to that suggestion. Um, so that's one aspect that informs uh, how I look at the American cityscape. The other is my um, being born and raised in Martinsville, Virginia. Martinsville is a very small uh, town in the southwest corner of the state. Uh, our house was five miles from the Virginia, North Carolina line, and we were about three hours um, uh, east of the Tennessee border. So that kind of orients you geographically. Um, it was uh, and still is a town that uh, has a lot of wealthy people in it, um, white wealthy people who uh, benefited from uh, the furniture industry and textile industry. Um, but it also has a, a very large population of uh, poor black people. Uh, and there, the town remains quite segregated in terms of the city and where people reside um, and what the populations of the school look like and so forth. Um, and in that city, it, with walking distance of my house, it was a very small town, but walking distance of my house in the downtown area was the courthouse. And it was the courthouse until I think maybe a decade ago. So until very recent history. Um, and this was the courthouse uh, where 
you know, the only courthouse in, in our city and where all kinds of trials, as you might imagine, um, took place. And in front of this courthouse um, in 1901 was added a Confederate monument. Um, and that was added by the United Daughters of the Confederacy, uh, the Mildred Lee branch of the Daughters of the Confederacy, um, which was uh, and still is an active group, uh, sort of social and politically active, active group um, who really wanted to um, <clears throat> sort of frame the history of what happened during the Civil War in, in terms that defended the South and the South's stance um, as, um, you know, a, a place where these genteel uh, generals and brave soldiers fought against um, the tyranny of uh, the Union. Um, and that framing of that discourse and tying into that other untruths about um, how the Civil War was actually not about slavery, about how uh, the slaves were actually happy um, and creating this sort of myth that uh, is called the lost cause um, was propagated through their work and, and still is um, both through public monuments like this one in Martinsville but also through textbooks um, and, you know, it's quite a marketing campaign. Um, they edited uh, the history and social studies textbooks that were used in my state, including the ones I learned from um, until quite recently um, and made sure that this myth of the lost cause is, is what we were taught. Um, and, and frankly, I never had a teacher that went against that way of describing what happened during the Civil War and very much grew up um, because of that with the mindset that Robert E. Lee and others like him were the kind of ideal Southern gentleman, um, never sort of questioning what actually happened, what it was really about and, and what these men actually stood for. But these monuments that were placed around by the United Daughters of the Confederacy in conjunction with the Ku Klux Klan, which they very much supported financially, were really meant to, to endorse and um, reinforce these ideals of the lost cause. In Martinsville, um, and we're looking at another image here of that same courthouse um, with the, the monument um, placed in front of it. Um, and in this image, you can see that to the right of the courthouse, as we're facing it, there are a lot of business fronts, little storefronts, and it, that is still the case. That is sort of the marker of the beginning of the business part of, of downtown. Um, we had lots of nice stores um, and department stores and, and other things um, that were uh, during the period of segregation only intended for uh, white folks to shop in. And, you know, even when I was growing up, you would not see black people in these stores for the most part. So that kind of segregation certainly uh, held on long past um, the end of uh, segregation. On the left side of the image and left side of the courthouse was the area that began the black part of town. Um, and this was a very vibrant cultural center for black culture uh, in our town um, and had really been settled by black people right at the end of um, the Civil War um, once they were freed. Um, but it was an area that, uh, as is true in many places across um, the South or elsewhere that were affected by segregation, the black schools and you know, any sort of black community support was really very paltry compared to what the white part of town enjoyed. Um, but I bring all of this up because I see the placement of that Confederate monument right at the crossroads of the white and the black parts of my hometown as being really significant. It maps 
exactly where those delineations are, but it also is meant to reinforce um, that our side of town very much uh, supported the efforts of the Confederate soldiers and we still very much hold them up as um, a, a model of the way uh, we should behave and that we laud um, their efforts in protecting Southern heritage. I think it's you know, particularly significant that it's in front of a courthouse um, and you can, I think, easily imagine and extrapolate how a Black person would feel as they were going to face trial in this space where outside there is a monument that is proclaiming um, that slavery was uh, not an issue, um, not a problem, and that uh, you know the power of the white people in town and those belief systems are what uh, should be remembered. Um, but Virginia, as I said earlier, uh, is filled with um, uh, Confederate monuments, but they are also found all over the place, uh, which I think is telling in terms of what their meaning is. Um, there are 1,568 Confederate monuments in 12 Southern states. Um, they are also in town squares, courthouse lawns, and in every state capitol building in the South. Um, a thousand of them were placed between 1890 and 1950, so well after the end of the Civil War. They are not um, monuments that would be more the norm, which are erected right at the end of a war um, in celebration of victory, right? These are monuments that are actually um, sort of raising up the defeated um, and the, the, the people that were um, found to be treasonous in um, this conflict with the Union. So that those years, of course, are important, uh, 1890 to 1950, and, and are aligned with efforts uh, for um, greater freedoms for Black people in our country, um, greater integration, for example, um, it, with Brown versus Board of Education, um, you know, as that uh, becomes law, the um, we see schools being named after Confederate generals like Robert E. Lee. We see monuments going up um, to Lee and other Confederate monuments on school grounds, as, clearly as a means to you know, send a message of um, defiance against this integration of the schools and to serve as a reminder um, both to the white people and, and the black people that were attending those schools about who's in charge. Uh, there are 27 Confederate monuments in Texas. There are 16 more um, added across the South after the passage of the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. So we can really align these with these changes in uh, protections um, and rights for um, Black people uh, in our country. Um, but what I think is so extraordinary and so telling is that we see Confederate monuments being placed in areas that had the opposite to do with uh, the Confederacy, places like Maine, Oregon, New York, Montana, places that that you know clearly had had no um, importance or, or any role in terms of the Confederacy. So quite extraordinary, and I think says a lot about what the true meaning of these sorts of sculptures are. The Southern Property Law Center has tracked um, this um, overlap of uh, important law cases or other moments in American history with the erection of monuments or naming of schools, courthouses, and so forth after uh, the Confederate soldiers, uh, generals in particular. Um, and you can see that here that the key years really are, you know, especially around 1890, 1896, you have Plessy versus Ferguson, then, you know, you've got the Klan that reemerges, you've got the Tulsa race riots, it's like every time, you know, there is some sort of movement um, towards greater civil rights, there's an uptick in 
both monuments and, and naming, but also in um, things like the reemergence of uh, the Ku Klux Klan, the Tulsa race riots, and so forth. So you see this sort of ebb and flow. Another moment is in 1954 with uh, Brown versus Board of Education um, and this um, uptick after that, um, you know, as the civil rights movement is really um, starting to get some traction, um, we see a lot of uh, monuments being placed uh, yet again in these very important sites of city squares in front of town halls, in front of courtyards and um, for schools. So it is the United Daughters of the Confederacy that are kind of at the heart of this monument mania that happens um, starting in the 1890s. They um, still very much identify as a group that is meant to protect and honor um, the memory of, uh, as they say, honoring the memory of their Confederate ancestors, protecting, preserving, and marking the places made historic by Confederate valor, collecting and preserving the material for a truthful history of the war between the states. This is, um, you know, their, their version of truth, of course. This is the, the truth that of, as they see it, of, um, you know, what, what is actually the myth of the lost cause. But, you know, they made this statement in 2018. It's not like this is what they said in 1890. Um, so that it's very much still a part of their mission. Um, and even as we start to see monuments that they raised fall down, they are reiterating um, the uh, values that they've always held as central. One key place where the United Daughters of the Confederacy um, made their mark was on Monument Avenue in Richmond, Virginia, which I am sure you all have seen in the news. Um, and Richmond was three hours north of me growing up um, and was one of our big cities we would go um, to visit. And I very much remember um, driving down Monument Avenue and just how impressive um, this series of sculptures was. Again, certainly not questioning who they were or why they were there or, or any of that, but being certainly impressed by the beauty of um, the landscape design and the, the placement of these statues. It's quite an impressive place to see. Monument Avenue developed as a place where um, exclusively white people uh, could own property. This was written into the um, contracts um, when people would buy houses um, in this area that it could only be to white people. Um, and then the landscape design uh, is meant to reinforce that with um, the statues of the Confederate generals um, that marked you know, down the median as you were going through this beautiful tree-lined avenue and Monument Avenue is you know, in the fan district, the most beautiful houses in Richmond um, align each side of it. So it is a place that very much centers um, the, the important presence of white people and, and the benefits they enjoy in the city of Richmond. Richmond is a, a very diverse city. Um, certainly the representation of all these white people concentrated in Monument Avenue does not reflect the po city population of Richmond. Um, and that was true even when Monument Avenue was made, but it was part of that effort to maintain you know, these boundaries in the cityscape between where the white areas were and where the black areas were. One of the monuments on Monument Avenue is, was uh, the monument of Robert E. Lee, uh, which was done by um, Antonin Mercier. And this was a sculpture that was really meant to be the center point of the Monument Avenue sculpture uh, series. Um, Robert E. Lee, certainly the most revered of those Confederate generals and, and held up as a real model of, of Southern manhood uh, in important ways. Um, and it, believe me that there are still many, many people in the South that feel 
um, exactly that way about Robert E. Lee. And there's been a great deal of pushback um, against the, the calls for having the monument removed. Um, and these calls for having, you know, questioning the presence of the monument actually began as soon as the monument arrived in Richmond and was erected on Monument Avenue on May 31st, 1890 in the Richmond Planet, which was a black run newspaper. Um, one writer um, really questioned what it means to have this monument be placed uh, in the center of Richmond. Um, and reminds the reader that Richmond, the capital of the late Confederacy, has been decorated with emblems of the lost cause. When the boxes containing the bronze monument of General Robert E. Lee were removed from the cars, no flags of the Union ornamented the procession, only the stars and bars, the Confederate flag, could be seen. The rebel yell under the folds of the flag of secession, which waved proudly after 25 years rent the air. But what does this display of Confederate emblems mean? What does it serve to teach the rising generations of the South? Why this placing of Lee on equality with Washington, Jackson, with Marion and Stuart, with Light Horse Harry of other days? There is lacking in all this display the proper appreciation of the Union. There's evidence that the loyalty oft expressed penetrates no deeper than the service. So really questioning, you know, how can we say that we are now part of the union while also raising up these symbols that are obviously in contrast to that. On the other hand, um, a white man, Archer Anderson, a Richmond industrialist and former member of the Confederate Army, uh, said of the Robert E. Lee, right as it was being raised, it will teach generations yet unborn and stand as the embodiment of a brave and virtuous people's ideal leader. So he was very clear about what the meaning of this monument was meant to be um, for those in uh, Richmond. After much pushback and discussion about what should be done with this highly problematic monument and the other monuments on Monument Avenue, um, finally the Robert E. Lee Monument was removed on September 8th, so just a little bit over a month ago, um, and these two images document that. But it was a very long and difficult path to get to this point. The other monuments of Confederate generals had been removed, but not this one. And, and again, since Robert E. Lee still is seen to really embody the values of the South, the Southern heritage and those ideals of manhood, there was a lot of um, concern, pushback, and people crying out that we were erasing history with the removal of this monument. And that's what brings me to ask, you know, whose history are we erasing when monuments like this um, are removed? It, it is not the history of the realities of what happened in Virginia and elsewhere during these Jim Crow years. It's not the reality of the very difficult integration of Black people into um, accepted white culture in the South. Um, and, you know, what it erases is, in my opinion, but I, I'm certainly not alone in this, is this um, anomaly of having monuments of the defeated so lauded and so centered as important public monuments uh, in the city of especially such a diverse um, place where, uh, you know, instead we should be valuing and setting up to for values and, and models of morality, if that's what monuments should serve, um, surely we need to move on from these monuments that raise up uh, people who absolutely fought for um, maintaining Southern traditions, including uh, the institution of slavery. Ralph North, um, the governor of Virginia, um, said on the occasion of the removal of the monument, the public monuments reflect the story we choose to tell about who we are as a people. 
It's time to display history as history and use the public memorials to honor the full and inclusive truth of who we are today and in the future. And I think that's really what's, uh, it's an important statement as we think about other monuments that are around the country and what we should do with them. And the answer is not always to remove them. And certainly it's not always to destroy them, but we do need to have some dialogues around what should happen with the monuments that we decorate our cityscapes with. The Monument Lab, um, a nonprofit public art and history lab in Philadelphia has been tracking and doing some data analysis around public monuments in the United States. And they um, have raised uh, you know, visibility about what, who it is that we have monuments of. And this is their top 50 um, people we have monuments to in the United States. And you know, some of them are problematic people, I think by, by most measures, including at number six, Robert E. Lee. Um, but there's also Stonewall Jackson. And at number 12, number 13, Jefferson Davis. Um, there are other people that are not um, Confederate uh, soldiers, but uh, people that certainly did damage um, uh, to many of the native peoples in the United States and to other people of color, um, including Junipero Serra, uh, who was a missionary in California, I'll talk about briefly in just a moment. Christopher Columbus um, is another, Andrew Jackson. And, you know, I think Nathan Bedford Forrest at number 44 uh, that um, really gave a restart to the Ku Klux Klan. Um, there are a bunch of really problematic people that we still decorate our public spaces with in the United States. We need to consider what implications there are of that. Um, Wikipedia, uh, not always the source I rely on, but has put a list together of the monuments that have been removed. And I just wanted to share very quickly. I don't know if you're able to see this though. You may not be able to. So I, I will share this um, as a link um, so you can look at it uh, when you would like. Um, but it is a list of all of the monuments that have been removed since 2020. And there are hundreds of monuments um, and I think in some ways that that um, causes some panic um, of, of folks who worry that we are causing that erasure of history or we're you know, acting too quickly in thinking about um, who's in our public spaces. Some examples of monuments that have been removed include these by Junipero Serra, who I'm, I mentioned just a moment ago. Um, Serra was a, um, a, a man from Spain who uh, came uh, to the United States, um, to California specifically, and created missions and enslaved the indigenous people of the area to work in the mission to build them and, and service them. Um, and has been uh, the target of a lot of protest and pushback among uh, indigenous people in California and their allies. Um, and so these statues have been removed. Prior to that, they had certainly been vandalized. And these were not statues that were just in front of the missions, which maybe one could argue is, um, while public, it's still you know a church and so part of private property on that regard, but some of them were in front of um, uh, municipal buildings, in front of um, uh, tribunals where, um, especially placed when uh, indigenous rights were being ratified um, by the courts. And so very much like the case of the Confederate monuments, we see the same kind of trajectory looking at monuments of Serra. And my point is that it's not just the Confederate monuments that are problematic. We have monuments across the country that uh, are still very much lauding men who have very troubled histories and did damage to the people um, that they subjugated in, in, in various ways. Christopher Columbus has also certainly been targeted recently. Um, and, you know, there is the, the pushback that he 
uh, caused um, you know, a great deal of harm to Native Americans. Um, and it, there's also a question of you know, why he's lauded in the United States to begin with. Um, and most of the monuments to Christopher Columbus were put up by the Italian American community who was fighting against prejudice that they were experiencing um, and kind of tried to tie their um, presence in America back to Christopher Columbus, obviously an Italian himself, um, and sort of create this um, ideal of, you know, Italians being at the very heart of, of the United States and its history, and thereby they should not be treated, um, you know, in some in incredibly discriminatory ways about what places they could enter into, what jobs they could get, and so forth. So again, these are, are you know, a question of who's in charge and who's making the monuments and what might they mean, but this is sort of coming at it from another angle of those who are feeling discriminated against erecting monuments um, to serve a, a different sort of purpose. So public monuments are of course complicated. While some monuments are fairly easy to remove, others definitely are not. Um, and these are two such examples um, from Mount Rushmore, which was um, a sacred land of the Lakota Sioux, or Stone Mountain in Georgia, which is inscribed with uh, the Confederate generals um, and had been Cherokee and Creek Federation land. And what, what to do about monuments that, that, you know, especially in the case I think of Stone Mountain that are uh, of people I think we would more or less universally say need not be lauded anymore. Um, but what to do with this monument when it is now part of the natural landscape in a really seemingly permanent way. Other monuments are problematic in other ways. This is a monument of Lincoln um, and called the Emancipation Monument it's in Washington, DC. It is a monument where we see Lincoln uh, standing with a slave at his feet, crouching. He's very much like the slave we saw in the uh, Ferdinand of the First Monument. He is mostly nude um, and is clearly meant to be read as having been subjugated. Yes, in this case, he's breaking these chains, thanks to Lincoln, which is clearly what the meaning is supposed to be. But it is a, a clearly uh, iconographically meant to suggest his, um, his lower status as compared to the stately manner that we, we read Lincoln in. The, the thing about this monument is that it was paid for by newly emancipated slaves. Um, so freed men uh, and women, and in fact, it was a woman who was who donated part of her first paycheck as a free woman um, to start the fund that would then pay for this sculpture to be made. But when we see this monument today, it, you know, it, it wouldn't naturally strike us that this had been a monument paid for um, by black people that had been newly emancipated. Um, and, but even at the time, its iconography was questioned. Frederick Douglass, who had been present at the inauguration of the monument, later wrote, what I want to see before I die is a monument representing the Negro, not couchant on the knees like a four-footed animal, but erect on his feet like a man. Um, and, you know, that sort of idea of this iconography and, and how a contemporary Black person reacted to it certainly represents the pushback that this monument has gotten today. A, a recent public scholar, contemporary of ours, um, wrote, it's not enough to argue that free Blacks and formerly enslaved paid for the monument. It's not enough to argue that Archer Alexander's image is the model for the kneeling figure. He's the one who casts, uh, I mean, is the uh, model for uh, the, the Black man here. It's not enough to argue that Frederick Douglass delivered the dedicatory speech and recognized the role of Lincoln in Black freedom. It's not enough to argue that racist imagery has a lesson to teach us now. It's not enough to simply reinterpret for a 21st century public. We understand what we see, 
Friedman's memorial should not remain in this space. So still cause to have it removed. But even what last week, uh, we had instances here in Vermont that should make us stop and question uh, some of the monuments that we have around our state. Um, in at the Bennington Museum um, on Indigenous Peoples Day, formerly Columbus Day, um, these uh, their protesters uh, put up a sign uh, in front of the museum that just says "Land Back," uh, and then we see the statue of Lincoln, um, a very odd statue, uh, if you don't mind me saying, of a woman crouching at his feet under his cloak and then a nude young boy, um, a, an odd, odd in terms of its iconography to be sure, but it had been vandalized with red spray paint with the number 38. Um, and this was a statement to remind people that Lincoln's past is not immaculate and that he had been responsible for 38 Dakota men um, being slaughtered, um, you know, in while he was, you know, doing the Emancipation Pro Proclamation and other good things, he was also uh, not protecting um, indigenous people's rights. Other examples uh, around Vermont, like this one, uh, the Samuel de Champlain Monument uh, made by Ferdinand Weber, in 1967 um, on Alamot is uh, troubling I, from my perspective uh, with um, the same kind of iconography used as we've seen elsewhere. Um, proud Samuel de Champlain um, uh, sort of hanging over um, this uh, presumably Abenaki um, indigenous person that is in a canoe at his feet. Um, but it follows the same iconographical tradition and certainly I don't think really shows the kind of um, on par collaborative relationship that Samuel de Champlain supposedly enjoyed with the Abenaki people if that history is a true one. So again, just to say this falls into the same sort of pattern of iconography that should make us stop and think about whether this is appropriate, if it honors the Abenaki people in ways that they should be honored. Um, and if these are values about who is in charge that we want to share with young people of today who are looking at and engaging with um, these sculptures. So what are our options moving forward? And I will wrap it up with this. I think super important, uh, and I say this with some obvious bias, is to bring art historians and historians in to think about and help work through what the history of monuments are, um, to think about what could be lost or what could be gained conversely with their removal from public sites. We need to engage the public um, and it, the diverse voices of our cities to, to see how these um, sculptures may impact them, how they read them, what messages they think that they send, um, and really think more broadly about you know, what histories we're trying to preserve, whose history that is, who's, who's in charge of telling that history. And then there are options of moving the monuments, uh, adding other monuments to give them context, adding plaques to give some education and background, um, take them to museums or battleground cemeteries, memorial parks, or other sorts of other kinds of public sites that are not in the city square, reappropriate their imagery, reuse them in some way. And I can show you a quick example of that, reactivate them through street art and other contemporary artistic interventions. And sometimes just recycle them. This is often maybe the best thing to do with some of those Confederate monuments that have actually no artistic value, but were mass produced. A Couple of examples to show you what that could look like. Momenta Park in Budapest, Hungary, which is sort of a graveyard for communist monuments, it didn't mean their destruction, but you know certainly it takes them um, out of the cityscape. It shows this change in in government and values, but it still preserves them and preserves that history in ways that I think are really compelling and, and interesting. 
Um, there are ways within the museum, like Fred Wilson's Mining the Museum installation from 1992, where by showing empty spaces like these empty pedestals on the left hand of the image, we can try to give balance and at least recognize the absence in the histories that we're telling, uh, even of, of great Marylanders like Harriet Tubman, Frederick Douglass, and Benjamin Banneker, who were not recorded in the Maryland Historical Society otherwise. Here's an example of a projection of on the Robert E. Lee Monument before it was taken down. Um, Dustin Klein, a digital artist, used um, the monument and its pedestal as a sort of canvas for his projections. And they would rotate uh, different kinds of images that he would project there. Kahindi Wiley, um, a fabulous uh, painter, and in this case, sculptor, um, has done uh, this monument for Richmond, and it is not far from Monument Avenue, uh, and is meant to counteract some of the uh, equestrian type of imagery that we see here, with, that we saw in the, the Confederate generals, and instead show us um, a native, uh, you know, we see a Native American or African man as he can be read uh, in this setting instead. Finally, uh, a new monument was put in place on September 22nd, uh, so not even a month ago, uh, no, exactly a month ago, of um, Thomas J. Warren, uh, with this Emancipation and Freedom Monument. Uh, monuments like this that can give context, can tell more of the historical truth um, than what we saw in Virginia prior to this that was such a celebration of the lost cause. And I will end it with that. I think we should allow some time um, for questions or comments if you have them and I will stop sharing my screen. Okay, thank you, Kelly. This is Michael. Yeah. We, um, we do have uh, a few questions. Uh, some people who are widely admired today might become controversial or polarizing in the future. Yes. If new information about the person becomes available or if attitudes of the public just change. Yep. Should we just stop building statues of people altogether? <laughs> well, I have to say I'm a big fan of abstract sculpture precisely for that reason. I think, you know, there are ways that um, abstract monuments can or, or my, maybe better to say monuments that are more about a value than they are about an individual person, maybe one way to get around that problem. But I also think we just need to be willing to let go of monuments when they um, become passe for whatever reason. We need to be willing to take them out of our public spaces and say, you know, it served its purpose. Um, we now see that as a problem or this person is problematic and that's okay and move on. I don't think monuments are actually meant to be permanent. Okay, um, we have a question that asks, what are your thoughts regarding current comments and efforts about removing artworks that depict nudity in 3,000 year old sculptures? I can't even say that I have heard that. I, I can't even imagine uh, where that might be happening. Um, you know, I think America is a very Puritan place, but I don't think that's the norm elsewhere uh, in terms of, of nudity. Um, I certainly don't see any issue with uh, showing the nude body in sculpture. It has. It is part of um, a very, very, very long history of not only of art, but of the human race. And in fact, I see nudes as a way of making art more sort of accessible and identifiable as they don't have on clothing that sort of puts them in a particular place and time. Um, they're more uh, universal than that. And you know, certainly I think uh, the beauty of the, the human body is something to be celebrated. I say that in part as a Renaissance sculpture scholar, so full transparency on that front. Okay, another questioner asks, what is your opinion about tearing down monuments if they offend certain segments of our society? 
So I think that the diff, the important point for me is where are those monuments? When monuments are on public land, then they should reflect universally held values. Are any values held universally? That may be a question for a philosopher to answer. Um, but I, you know, I think that if there are people that raise significant questions with the presence of um, you know, a sculpture that lauds a particular person or value, we should take that to heart. We should listen to that. We should, again, be willing to take those sculptures out of our public spaces. It doesn't mean they can't go in private spaces. It doesn't mean they can't go in museums, but the public landscape should be a place where we find a place to build community, not to segment it through problematic monuments. Another question, please. Uh, many Confederate soldiers who died in the Civil War did not have slaves. And they may not have been voluntarily uh, enlisted into the, into the war effort. Today, is it possible at all for their descendants and others to honor these people for their service and sacrifice? If so, um, how? Oh boy. Well, I think, you know, again, I have to point out that um, the Confederacy lost. The Confederacy was very short lived, and that the Confederacy was about uh, pretty specific things that I think we should find abhorrent. So I think, you know, I, I certainly have ancestors that fought in, in on the Confederate side. I certainly do not raise statues to them <laughs> around my house or anywhere else. I accept that that is a part of my family's history. It is a part of my family's history that, um, you know, I think if we dig into anybody's family's history, we're going to find people that did things in that history that we're not proud of. We can honor military service, but I think it, it's questionable to do so. Um, depending on what people fought for. I mean, I think families in Germany might be able to have some thoughts about that as well, right? Would you similarly want to, you know, laud those uh, people that fought in World, World War II that maybe didn't have an option or didn't see a way out of it? Um, so I think we have to be very careful. I certainly honor our servicemen writ large, but I think we also have to be willing to accept um, when poor decisions were made that we no longer can celebrate. Thank you. I think that's all the questions we have for now, but uh, there certainly is a lot of uh, food for thought for us to, to think about. So I'll, um, I'll say thanks, uh, Kelly, and pass it over to Carol. Oh, yes. Thank you, Kelly. This was really interesting. Very, very lot for us to think about and ponder. Thank you so much and see you all next week. Thank you, Michael, too. Bye, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thanks again.